who is known on the web as Hattrick Penry. He is a, a messenger. He bears documents that carry more probative weight than anything released since March 11. Uh, 11. They are transcripts of uh, Nuclear Regu Regulatory Commission hearings, and they tell us a truth that matches reality and uh, uh, it's it's time that everybody started using those as a benchmark because we can't trust anything else. I think probably most of the anti-nuclear movement will be listening tonight. It's going to be a big show. Great. Michael Rupert right now. Again, on the 1st of December, 2013, we made it this far, yeah. Uh, huge show tonight, but uh, got to share some things up front before we bring on Patrick Penry, Tony Muga, yeah. I've been snowed in for six days. I got my car out yesterday. Uh, snowed in meaning uh, almost no human contact for six days which was a vision quest all by itself. I, uh, uh, I'm asking the cold to teach me lessons this winter. Uh, from what I hear from the locals who have lived here for a long time, search and rescue guys, it looks like it's, I'm, I'm going to be hitting 40 and 50 below. So I'm looking into things like uh, silk sock liners and insulated uh, coveralls, and uh, I'm taking lessons from the people who know. This makes you pay attention. I'm asking the cold to be, uh, to be a teacher to me this winter. We need, uh, there's something very important happening tomorrow, uh, and you guys have to please find any way to support. The al Sipatog and Mi'kmaq peoples who have fought successfully in New Brunswick to uh, stop uh, fracking on sovereign native lands are back at it again because uh, the uh, powers that were, of course, don't give up. Canadian government said clearly it's working uh, on behalf of and executing the word of the Queen of England in uh, bringing the fracking trucks back onto the land. And uh, and uh, these brave warriors are out doing it again. They're doing roadblocks tomorrow. Uh, they have called for an urgent, uh, urgently worldwide for support people to show up and show support in any way possible. I would encourage you to do that. You can find out everything you need to know by going to lastrealindians.com, lastrealindians.com. They are fighting for all of us. They're fighting for all life. And they're fighting the Queen of England. And for all you who have followed all this and wonder who the heads of, of the old paradigm are, I don't know many many or any names higher on the list. And they're taking her on, and they're taking that concept on, and they've won. You need to support them. Tomorrow's the day. Check it out, please. Okay, so before we get into uh, what we're going into tonight, uh, I want to set a theme for what we're doing because I really understand that there's a lot on the line tonight. There is a lot being discussed, and perhaps most of the anti-nuclear movement is listening uh, because they're wondering how to process a whole lot of things in a world. They're trying to make sense out of a world full of nonsense, and that, that's what we're here to do tonight. But this is very important, and this is going to set a tone. There was a thread on my Facebook page that's going to apply tonight to, uh, to how we approach people who we have looked to for information. Uh, and the thread was actually about the Pope, Pope Francis, who has been making some really excellent statements about money uh, that, are, that, that signal huge shifts uh, in uh, in in the position of the Catholic Church and and uh, and I read one recently and I was pretty impressed with the words and I felt some sincerity there, but it triggered a good a, a good discussion. And I wrote, I have to say, this is on Facebook, that I welcome and encourage the Pope's statements. I'm not forgetting the Church's history. I'm not ignoring it. It's not that I suddenly trust the Church, but if we rule out the possibility of awakening those who have been blind or even enemies, then we close the possibility to that door for ourselves. I believe that the correct approach is to accept without ridicule any new stated positions and encourage further movement towards the truth. It's easy to sit back and just condemn everything. That's easy to condemn, but the end result is that we will still wind up powerless, fragmented, and alone. Uh, and, and you know some of the comments were if the deeds match the sentiment then awesome and and uh, 
Love Thy Enemy is all about being open to reconciliation in my book. Reconciliation means only after a change has come from, from the perpetrator, the one who is changing their lives. Someone else uh, respectfully disagreed. Actions are what count. The Catholic Church wants to make amends or recompense, and it should begin by redistributing its massive, sometimes criminally acquired wealth. It isn't tiresome and hypocritical when someone or some entity says, I'll do it as long as everyone else does it too. The Church is, concentra is concentrated power. The Pope is one man with one opinion. Those are nice sentiments. A lot of skepticism, but there was a lot of anger toward the Church and a lot of demand for retribution. So, uh, and I responded, so you think it's better if the world's three billion Catholics here and ponder a different message, like the one the Church always carried? The, you know, the, these are drastically different words, and they're issued as encyclicals or, or papal statements, and Catholics read them, and they take them to heart. They, like us, are individuals with their own consciousness. So, and so how has the mainstream media controlled us? They did so by feeding us bad messages, if good messages are coming out. But this leads, it's leading to a deeper point. Someone then a poster said, "Lead by example. You know, you just don't 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 talk it, walk it. Start giving your wealth back. Start dismantling your your vast ownership." And then I said, "You know, I, I wrote back. If we're going to lead people out of enslaved consciousness, we lead them with baby steps. If it's if the church is having an awakening, and my job as a scout is to see that those who are capable of having one have one." And I said, you know, you lead, lead people out of enslaved consciousness, you lead with baby steps. You hit them with the full truth right away and hold them to standards that we have arrived at through years or decades of painful personal growth and work, and they'll run away. That's a very, very important for our subject matter tonight. Newborn consciousness needs to be fed breast milk, a steak dinner with baked potatoes, and apple pie will kill it. And this poster came back, man, but yeah, but we need to go in and redistribute the wealth. You know, it's like, and I wrote, hey, man. You know, uh, and I responded in 12-step recovery, uh, which we've talked about a lot here. Making amends is the ninth step, ninth step. There are eight which come before, which go along with the change of consciousness that must be completed be before restitution. Your anger puts you in a place of wanting pure fantasy to legislate these acts through the mechanisms of the old paradigm, you know, swords and axes, go take the church's money, make them do it, beat them, what? That only reinforces a selfish urge, selfish urge uh, and engenders resentment in those who are just awakening, might be taking the right steps. Somebody gets it, uh, another comment of the tide is definitely turning, just the fact that Pope, Pope, Pope Francis has not suddenly died like Pope John Paul I did after 33 days, I remember that. It says tons about the lack of cohesiveness of the darkest groups inside the city-state. Remember that the Pope also went after the Institute of Religious Works, a.k.a. Vatican Bank. I agree with the MCR, our longing for a quick, quick and swift consciousness shift can and has hurt the awakening of many. And it went back and forth. And again, the demand came. The Catholic Church must redemand it. I don't like them. Uh, you know, I don't listen to this. Uh, and I said that in my response, then help the Catholic Church work the first eight steps with encouragement, support, and without condemnation. Don't try and force them when they aren't there yet. Um, and so basically what this came down to well, I made a statement that says, it is our most sacred obligation to hold open, as spiritual warriors, warrior of light, to hold open and safe the space which we want our fellow humans to enter and occupy so that all who are truly willing to change can enter with us. The fundamental issue is not for us to decide. The fundamental issue is whether the expressed willingness is sincere or not. If the willingness is sincere, it will be, will be followed by action. If it isn't, there's nothing we can do about it. If the ones who are unwilling to change who, or who are insincere liars, uh, who are enemies, uh, we don't waste a moment of time on them except at some point to remove them. Sacred, to hold open the possibility of change of consciousness without calling people's people names or judging them. That's, a very, that's just a critical point that I want to make to my tonight. There are certainly those who will continue to lie and deceive us. They are shills. They are liars. They are uh, active, knowledgeable, willing agents of, of, of untruth, of evil, of lying, of darkness. And, and the, the ones who are not willing to change, those are the ones when the time comes we draw our swords against with a fury. A fury. Uh, I've been waiting for that for a long time. 
so that's the point. And so what I want to open this uh, show tonight with uh, Patrick Penry, a.k.a. Tony Muga. I'm going to like to say that name. I don't know. Tony Muga, I just want to say it. Uh, is, is, is that Arnie Gunderson, Helen Caldecott, we, I'm not coming after you. We, you have served us enormously. You have taught us. You have, you have helped us to understand what's going on. And there are so many other people. I'm not sig- signaling you out. There are certainly press agencies and shills and TEPCO and people that have lied and spread bad truth, but not everybody is a shill. And the, the door is wide open. I wrote Arne Gunderson an open letter, which I read on the show two weeks ago. He has not responded I wish he would. I really wish he would. I wish Chris Busby or Helen, who I'd love, she's been a guest on the show, a wonderful heart, wonderful passion, very eloquent, would step up and address these things because we got something very important to talk about. And what we're talking about is a series of a, a, a collection of documents that, by legal standards, have greater and more probative value than any newspaper article or any statement, any press release that has thus far been issued with regards to to the conditions at Fukushima Daiichi reactor complex on the east coast of Japan. These are documents that were obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request that were sent in an envelope by the U.S. government, the NRC, Nuclear Re- Regulatory Commission, with the stamp and seal of a court reporter notary who prepared the transcription and certified it as authentic. So really, in a sense, my guest tonight, Patrick Penry, uh, who is on the line right now, is absolutely irrelevant. What he's done is to have the courage, the intelligence, to recognize the the importance of these documents and work like a maniac to get people to pay attention to them in that we have discovered that he's a he's a really capable video producer he's a musician he can uh, he can narrate uh he's a teacher he's a scout tony welcome to the lifeboat hour man well mike it's an honor and a privilege and again i remembered to call you mike i'll try not to call you sir or mr rupert tonight <laughs> <laughs> and i appreciate the lead in and you know i agree with everything you say I, like we talked before i mentioned i'm studying the precepts of zen buddhism i'm a practicing christian but like I, i'm like you i'll draw from anything from anywhere if it makes sense and that's kind of what i'm you know the the tact I'm taking, the direction I'm taking now is I want to be a little more uh, open to people and just more easy on people and just try to unify and bring people in to the information and warm them up to the information. Like you said, it's a lot of information. Yeah. It's a lot to take in and a lot to digest. So I, it's not fair of me to expect people to know this intimately overnight. So. Yeah, yeah, but but you know I can certainly understand also the sense of urgency and the power because I have made a, a life career off of document analysis and and learning how to not only read them but to give them probative value and analyze them and to stand up and shout the message that they carry. So, that being said, tell us the history. These are documents released under the Freedom of Information Act. Who asked for them? When? When were they sent? When did they arrive? Where can people look at these? Because I want the listeners tonight to whoop out a pencil so they can actually go look at some of these documents with us. Tell us that story real quick. Well, first of all, it's very easy to find the documents. If you just type Nuclear Regulatory Commission NRC, they have a, a website, and the bulk of these documents are contained at that website. All my videos and my book, Something Wicked This Way Comes, I link to the NRC website because you can always go there. It's a vast collection of documents. I don't deny it. It may be literally millions of pages, and it's a pain in the butt to go through. Tonight, I'll, I'll provide uh, you guys uh, some links. I hope you got my email with the links in there in case people want to check these documents. Well, you, we look you have a my website, uh, hatrickpenry.wordpress.com. That's Patrick Henry. Play Pig Latin with it, hatrickpenry.wordpress.com. Now, okay, for... Uh, uh, Quick questions. Who who originally requested these documents? Is it a person? Is it a human being? Okay, good question. Originally, the Associated Press, Friends of the Earth, there were a number of media outlets or uh, groups, environmental-type groups, that were 
suing, well, not suing, but filing for, paying for particular transcripts, they would say, I want the telephone transcripts of this day or this particular conversation, mm -hmm. and they try to be direct when you do it that way. All these, anyone can look them up, but when you go into freedom of information, at least my understanding is, you're kind of paying for them to sift through and, and give you specific documents of a time or date or place of particular people. What uh, okay, how did these documents get into your hand? That's what I want to know. Was, was there, did, did you find them yourself? Did, did someone else do it? You heard about it from somebody else? How did, I have to establish right. chain of custody. The initial flow went like this. I, my mom cued me into what was going on. She had been to informable.com, Lucas Hickson's site, where she had read some documentation. I think Joy Thompson was a writer there back in the day that had a really good initial article. So from, from a, some documents there, my mom came to me and said, look, this is a big thing. You need to look into this. And that's how it was initially brought okay. to my attention. Okay, that's good. That's what I want to know. So these, th these documents are all available just with a few clicks. I know th the links have been up on my Facebook page to where people have actually downloaded many hundreds of pages of documents that are on file. Somebody found complete transcripts of telephone conference calls in, in the days immediately following the earthquake and tsunami. Who found those, and w were they easy to find? Which Are you talking about specific documents here? Or just yeah, in I, general? I, the, the, the initially, the earliest you could get your hands on these documents was late July or early June of 2011. Mm -hmm. That's when they initially came out. Within mm -hmm. 60 days, Mike, you had some documentation come out that really shed light on this massive cover-up of the plume and cloud and fallout and, and, and what have you. So within 60 days, you had some really damaging evidence that was publicly available. Ninety percent, I'm told, of the uh, freedom of information was sought after by the Associated Press. So they were the really big players who okay. really wanted to go in and, and get as much as they could. So, so the bottom line is once they became available within a few months after 311-11, uh, uh, then, then people actually started looking at them and saying, oh, wait a minute, there's some serious stuff in here. Is that about right? Yes, but I would say on a, a very small scale, there's a, you know, people interested in these documents. I'm sure you're aware of E&E News. They hosted some of these documents and, and some information I got from there to send me deeper and explore further because some people would just kind of touch upon them, whereas... I wanted to really go in depth and get the meat, the substance of what was in these documents, try to digest them, and then try to, in a simple format, put right. it out there in layman's terms for everybody to understand. Okay, all right. Now we've we're, got to move along past this because we want to get into what the documents actually say. Yeah. Many of these documents were telephone transcripts of involving people like the chairman of the NRC, then uh, Gregory Jasko, uh, a guy named Chuck Casto, who you found to be uh, consistent, uh, uh, male participant, a lot of other names in there, and, and there was also some r redaction. So I want to make sure we're talking about the same set of documents, because I'm looking at one with page number 137 on it. Uh, that says uh, this is going going to progress to the point. This is Chairman Jasko, Chairman Jasko, at which we probably have we think I have to assume at this point that we're going to have three reactors out of control and possibly up to six spent fuel pools. Male participant agreed. I think we need need to take whatever actions are necessary to deal with that. Now this is just one of many documents, but. I'm going to ask you in a second just to give some very short quotes because we we have to be budget our time very carefully here. Yes, uh, tonight uh, that that it, it is a given from at least four or five different points that the, that the spent fuel pool at reactor number four was completely combusted. There was nothing left of it. All the fuel was gone. Same thing with number three. Deep questions about two and one, but three three meltdowns, and this completely contradicts. <clears throat> anything that we have been told officially or even by people like Arnie Gunderson. And I wish he would respond because, you know, he just, I, I, I pray to God he will. But, so, very bad conditions. Now, we're 20 minutes after the hour. Really intense here, and I got everybody listening. 
All right, let's do a couple of minutes here, and then I'm going to play a song. And this is how this is one of the ways that I I, I introduce my guests to my family. Here is that the music that we pick reveals uh, what's in our heart. Uh, and uh, Tony is also a uh, very accomplished musician and songwriter singer. Uh, we will get there in a minute because we can read. Uh, Cartesian science can't marry, uh, can't measure heart, but music and art sure do. Okay, before we go to the song, which you're going to tell us about, read us a couple of other quotes that are very in your face clear. Can you do that? Okay, I'm pulling from the document that talks about the walls being blown out on Unit 4, and this is John Moniger. He's an NRC official who is embedded with TEPCO and government in Japan. He was very close proximity to what was really going on. And he says, Unit 1 and 2 is boiling down. Unit 3 and 4 is having Zerk water reaction. They believe there is essentially no walls on Unit 3. The explosion, I'm sorry, Unit 4, the explosion leveled the walls, leveled the structure for the Unit 4 spent fuel pool all the way down to the approximate level of the bottom of the fuel. So there's no water in there whatsoever, male participant, and no ability to retain water, John Moniger and no ability to retain water. And that one, again, I'm not going to, you just read one from that document. I'm not going to uh, beat the dead horse on that one. There's plenty of discussion of walls blown out, so on and so forth. But later in that document, page 421, you have a discussion between then-Chairman Jaxco, Elliot Brenner, head of Office of Public Affairs for the NRC, and Chuck Casto, who I still have a pretty good opinion of Chuck Casto out of all these characters. And here the discussion goes thus. This is in regards to their already stated position of this day, which is March 16th is this document. This is in reference to their already stated position, Jacksco, on Unit 4 being dry. He's already said this. And mm -hmm. so Elliot Brenner says, Mr. Chairman, Jacksco says, yes. Elliot says, I'm not hearing anything to suggest we should be rolling back tonight, correct? That means rolling back our statement is what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. Jacksco, yes, yes, that's correct. Elliot, thank you. Jacksco, anything else you want to add? Elliot, no, no. Jacksco, I mean, Chuck, let me ask you that. Do you think I need to roll back any of the statements that I made? Chuck Casto, I don't. I don't think so. You know, we've gone over it. It may not have been dry, but it certainly wasn't full. With the steam on it, it's inconclusive of where the water level is on Unit 4. Jacksco, okay. Casto, I think is the best. Jacksco, okay. Casto, or on Unit 3, certainly on Unit 3. Jacksco, okay. Casto, and without mitigating actions, without adding water to that spent fuel pool, it's, you know, Jacksco, it will be dry. Casto, you lose water. And that's really indicative of them saying, look, we're, we're, we're darn certain of this. We're certain enough we're not going to roll back that statement. It is what it is. Now, later, as we all suspect, phone calls are made, pressure is applied, and, and the story changes as, as it often does in these cover-ups, as you well know about that. So the, that little, yeah. those two parts right there are kind of uh, very there, revealing. There were other uh, spots where it, it was stated unequivocally, and I'm going to make a statement about that in a second, that the all of the fuel in, in, in the spent fuel pool for had been consumed, and there was one statement where it said it was just in a, in, in a pile on the floor, right. that, that, that there were no walls left. The, and, and, and what I want to note with this, as I read these, and I encourage everybody in the audience to go to these sites, and we'll give them out again. Read the documents for, for yourselves. That's your obligation. Uh, uh, that not once in any of these uh, transcripts that carry the weight, legal weight of depositions in court. That's why they have more probative value than anything else uh, that, that I have seen so far. Plus, they match physical reality that we know about better. But never once did I hear any of these participants equivocate. I didn't hear people saying, oh, well, I, Unit 4 might, uh, S SFP4 might have melted down. And I come from a government family, and I've you know, been in high-level briefings at, with LAPD and uh, Congress and you know, a lot of places. You never exaggerate. You never make absolute statements unless you know that what you're saying to your higher-ups is true and correct because they're making decisions on what you report. Okay, now, whether we're ready or not, I want to play your song. 
we're, we're into this. We're all on, in, in one side of our being or one side of our body. Uh, but uh, music is essential, and it's a way of bringing all of a human being into this place. Tony, you're a singer-songwriter. You wrote this song. Tell us about it in 10 seconds or less, and then we're going to play it. Well, in 10 seconds or less, it talks about the state of nuclear power, the, the big line, nuclear power. And the middle section of the song is like a tribute to my love for the Japanese people. And what's it called? It's called Nuclear Reality. Nuclear Reality by Tony Muga. Let's listen. Where can people hear your music? Uh, you can catch me on YouTube. I've got a playlist on YouTube, and I've got a couple on SoundCloud. I'm trying to build a, some, get some songs online. YouTube's the best place to go, and I've got a playlist there. You can listen to all. I've got six or seven originals online right now. What did, what did you play on that track? 
I do everything. I play bass guitar. I do lead, rhythm guitar, all vocals. I program drums. I write. I record. I do the mixing, the engineering. Kind of like Joe Satriani, only I actually sing and have a good voice. You know? Kind of like, like I think I do. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you, that, that was a great song, man. You you remind me a lot of uh, my bandmate, Doug Lewis, who I miss uh, so severely. He's out in Northern Cal with Squishy Rags' his best friend. Long story. We are at the bottom of the hour. This is Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth, here on the Lifeboat Hour on the Progressive Radio Network. We are rolling without a break tonight. We're just going to roll right through because this is a, a pretty important show. We got we have some some uh, actually emotionally charged, powerful points to make, and that 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 energy is present, and the music uh, kind of settles us down. You know, tell the drummer it's in G. I need to do some uh, uh, fundraising thank yous for all the great messages. I do what I do for free. Uh, I'm, I'm getting by okay now. I've given out the address. I'm not going to give uh, give that out tonight. I'm okay for the minute. Uh, but I have some great thank yous. Uh, and, and there's some great presents coming, too. Brad, uh, really a Daniel, uh, uh, sent me his book, a huge book, A Big History of Music, with a wonderful letter in there. And that's a, since it's going to be 40, 50 below, and I'm going to be spending a lot of time indoors this winter, I think I'm going to get to that. Thank you. To, to Frank Damiano, Grandma Coco, I love you. Joyce Katzberg sent me some great music. She's also a great singer-songwriter. Uh, to uh, Chana Maumi uh, uh, from Birmingham, England, my, my my dear friend who sends that he sent me this great sweater from England. And, and thanks to all of you. I'm getting so many messages of love right now and support from all the people who are my tribal friends, all the people who know how we take care of each other. And I am I- introducing... Uh, Tony into our circle tonight. I'm, I'm sure that you're already figuring out that he's a pretty cool guy. All right, Tony, when uh, some of the things that had really been bothering me about Fukushima, aside from everything, uh, was I kept hearing references to getting to the spent fuel pool at Reactor 3. And 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 I even think I heard Arnie Gunderson himself re, re, refer to that once. And uh, but certainly that's the official line. Now, we have the NRC documents which say clearly that there ain't no spent fuel pool of three. Forget about it. It's gone. And you can look at a photograph. You can look at the multitude of photographs of Unit 3 uh, and see that there aren't any upper floors. And they're GE Mark I reactors. Uh, and, and the spent fuel pools in all of them are like four or five floors, six floors up above the ground. And there are no upper floors because of the explosion there. So I'm wondering... Well, where is the spent fuel pool? That doesn't compute, the, 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 and that's what really prompted me. And I, I apologize for not, for not picking up on, on your stuff sooner. And I had to make amends for that to the, to the people that I serve and, 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 and to my honor. You know, it's like you're my karmic payback. You release thousands of pages of documents. You turn out amazing videos. You're very prolific, and 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 and. Uh, uh, and it took me a while for Spirit to kick me in the butt and say, you really need to look at this. And when I did, I, I corrected it immediately because you are carrying a valuable message. That makes you a trusted scout because you're carrying the truth that has nothing to do with who you are. Um, but I, I, I have to say, too, that other things came up. And maybe you've learned some lessons with this. I know you know, I have had expressed my opinions about Alex Jones many times, and we're not going to spend more than two 20 seconds on Alex Jones. I, he doesn't deserve that kind of time. But you took these documents to Alex Jones, and he brushed you off. But there was another tactic that was also employed that people like Jones tried to put on me, is that they would take the great work I'd done, and then they would plant one or two steps beyond where I was with other theories, such as the earthquake of September 11th was a deliberately orchestrated man, man-made event. Uh, which can't be, and that's how they discredit us. Share with us your position on that, because I've seen it attached to you early on. It, 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 what do you think about that? As far as you know, approaching Alex Jones or, in, or no? The, well, no. We already know that Alex Jones brushed you off. That that says enough. But uh, what about the concept? Do you endorse a belief that 311 was a man-made, deliberate event? And if so, who did it and with what motive? Well, I would say this on that. I cannot prove uh, beyond any reasonable doubt that it was a man-made uh, event. Right. Okay. Um, that being said, what what I try to concentrate on with these documents, and like we've discussed, is what I what I can prove, and what generally, when you look at the documents, that's 
that's what grabs you in your, in your feel and everything. So I've had this discussion with uh, some of my associates that I work with, and and we've, we've back and forth, and in the end we settle and said, look, it doesn't really matter if it was a, a natural event or if, you know, there's some kind of conspiracy and they're using some kind of weapons we don't understand. The fact of the matter is we now know, and that we can't argue, that the possibility exists, because it's already happened once, that one of these facilities can have a massive a catastrophic incident, regardless of how it was created. And that strikes to the fact that we just need to face reality and begin to decommission systematically all plants around the world as fast as possible because okay. if they're not a terrorist target now, as technology advances and considering the mentality of humans on this planet, they will be eventually if they're not now. So right. I don't argue how it happened. It's like with 9-11, I, I've been caught up in that argument. I look at people, I say, you know it was an illegal war, right? If me and Michael Rupert hijack planes and fly them into buildings in Russia, Russia does not get to come and attack and occupy America. That's a criminal uh, case. But really. here's it should the be pursued point. as much. But here's the big point. With 9-11, there was a motive, gain control of Iraqi oil. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, 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 and a whole bunch of other things. Right. There is no <laughs> motive. There is no motive that applies to this because the whole human race's life is in the balance. There's no guarantee of anybody surviving, and there's nothing to gain. Who benefits? That's the one question that has to be answered when you're alleging a crime: is who benefits? Nobody benefits from this if everybody dies. Right, but what I can say in key bono is that who benefits from the cover-up, and that is the nuclear industry and the arms industry and so on and so forth. So, again, when I stick to the non-superficial aspect and I say we know the accident happened, regardless of how it happened, we know there was a cover-up, let's concentrate on that provable cover-up and hold some people accountable because if we don't, it's like with 9-11, how many years go by before you know justice will never be served? Well, years yeah, later. yeah and, and of course, I've, I've taken the public position many, many times, and I, and I still take it to this day, that it's futile to pursue 9-11. The difference still being is that Fukushima is an ongoing event, almost three years old, in which the dispersal of radiation hasn't stopped for one damn day. Correct. And the other Correct. point, the, the other problem with, with that, of course, is that all human life is in jeopardy. And, and, and that catastrophic amounts far beyond. Uh, Helen Calicott was a guest on the show. She said there were 10 Chernobyls in the spent fuel pool at four. A total of, I think she said, 85 Chernobyls at all six fuel pools. We know that the fuel pool at Reactor 3 uh, contained super deadly MOX fuel. Now, if there is an attempt to conceal, and, 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 and I have to repeat that as I look at these documents, Tony, uh, you know, none of these guys equivocate. They're making emphatic statements. You know, it's, this fuel pool is gone. That's gone. This is burned. There's, no, no, there's nothing that can be done. Great discussions about the need to evacuate, discussions about the military, uh, and, 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 and those match what we have since learned, thanks to people like uh, Calicott and, and Arne Gunderson, uh, you know, about how much radiation is there. So if they're going through with this charade, I conclude, and let me ask you if this is your conclusion as well, that the one thing they really don't want us to understand is how much radiation has already been released and what the ramifications are. Does that ring with you? Is I that agree 100 percent. And if you just you know do a thought experiment and think about things from the the government, the people in control standpoint, if Fukushima was the worst of the worst, three reactors, all the spent fuel pools are pretty close to it. That much was released. They either lie about it and deceive us, okay, or they, or there may be some levels of honesty or dishonesty, or they can be completely honest. Now, being completely honest, again, mm -hmm. that's just not logistically or realistically possible. And I write about this in, in Fear and Loathing on Fukushima Unit 4 where I say, considering the proximity, the uh, magnitude of some of these 
c- catastrophes and these events, you can't move people quick enough out of the plume. In the case of Three Mile Island, I read four of your documents on that too. They said they they said some guy says you got to warn the people there's a plume. You have to let them know. The guy says, look, by the time we can let those people know who are in the path of the plume, the plume will have moved from that location, and we may be moving them into the path of the plume. <laughs> so there's no easy way. They could not tell the truth. And again, I look at the government. I say, if you're having angst about telling the truth in these things, I suggest you decommission and shut down systematically all nuclear plants. You won't have that problem. I don't have a definite alternative solution, but if we put free minds together and let them speak openly, like I like your stuff talking about the Indian elders and whatnot, I'd go to the Hopi Indians and ask them, how can we live, how can we make this work, you know? Yes, yes. Well, uh, we are getting close to my song, the, the, the one that I picked to play tonight. Uh, but it, I don't think anybody would dispute at this point that if three reactors are gone, one, two, and three, we know that those cores are gone. They've been discharging venting. And three or possibly four, reading the documents, it's, it's not clear whether they're sure about uh, reactor one's uh, spent fuel pool or two's. But three spent fuel pools, all of that is enough radiation to threaten all of human life on the planet already. Uh, and you know we see these great postings on Facebook, and I'm, I'm, you know these are not just somebody writing them. These are news stories documenting really horrendous spikes in radiation all over the world. Plus, we have the massive die-offs of starfish, of uh, uh, bluefin tuna. I mean, it, it's a huge long list. Polar bears, twenty percent of the polar bears, skin lesions, so on and so forth. That's a lot of radiation out there, and and as human beings. We deserve the right, we have the right to know what's going on here. And that's a fundamental human right. And, and this is where the truth is more important to our humanity uh, than, than anything else right now. So now I'm going to play my song. Now I picked a song tonight. We've played some amazing songs, Jackson Brown, Johnny Mitchell, a whole lot of songs and, and newer ones that were just so exceptionally prophetic. Um, in describing the times that we live in now. And I picked a song that may be one, one of, if not the most, prophetic song of all. And it was by a guy named Paul Simon and a guy named Art Garfunkel. And it was called Sound of Silence. And this was recorded in, uh, in Central Park in New York in, a, in the late 90s, I think it was. And uh, here it is, Sound of Silence. Simon and Garfunkel, Sound of Silence. Uh, and we cannot afford to be silent now. We cannot, uh, because our lives are on the line. And the truth is we are living in a world where the problem is not me, the problem is not Tony, the problem is not, the problem is that we don't know what the hell is going on at Fukushima, and we are being lied to. And now is the point in time when human beings who are aware of this will choose, can choose, have the opportunity to choose to be human themselves and shed light on this for us because our lives are at stake. Tony, you have been producing a number of short, excellent videos which are up on your WordPress site. They show up all over Facebook and YouTube. You have your uh, YouTube channel. Uh, what are you doing now? You've done, I think, four, four so far. Very excellent. You, you ask the right questions. You are a natural detective. You're a scout. You're screwed, buddy, <laughs> just like me. What are you doing next? What, what, what's, what's on your plate coming? Back over my book, Something Wicked This Way Comes. It's free available on my website. And I want to put it in a PDF form where you can go page by page and, you know, stop on one page and come back the next day because it is uh, fairly extensive. Uh, One thing I wanted to make sure, a couple things I want to say real quick. Sure. Um, In regards to the tsunami and earthquake drill that apparently occurred as the event in Fukushima, 
As far as that type of information goes, although I'm not a detective and an expert in pursuing it like a case, I feel on, on my behalf I'm responsible to the American public to at least put all information forth regardless of where it may lead and let them debunk it and let them look into it. Kind of this is what I've done, Mike, consistently with a number of these events, shootings, or whatever it is, having this crazy stuff going on. I'm very opinionated. I don't deny it, but I try to just put the information out there like you say, and I see this, I see this, there's a discrepancy here, and this is, you know, I leave it with the American public, and hopefully they come to decision about it. And secondly, if I could sure. clarify, because people ask me when the president said harmless levels, how could they say harmless levels? Extensively in this documentation, they're basing their models, and other, the ones the president will say harmless or Jacksco will say harmless, on four to five days or 96 hours worth of emissions. And as, as you clearly pointed out, you know, in, in especially in like a China syndrome meltdown, those emissions continue and continue and yes. continue. Yes, they're, the bolt come out initially and taper off, but they've got to model more completely. And so in those four to five days and 96-hour models, that was bunk. That was how, one of the ways they downplayed it and legitimized that Rose Garden speech. So th those two points I just wanted to, to make. Excellent. That's and what you bring up there, Tony, is to me the two most important qualities of a scout. One is honor and integrity. The edge of your knife must be sharp in what you report back to the tribe, because the scout's job, as my friend Michael Mantis wrote so eloquently, is to first of all track. We are trackers of truth, uh, and and we have to not get. To, re to follow false trails, we have not to miss. We have to avoid misreading trails. We have to avoid being led into ambushes, and they have been laid for you as they were laid for me. We have to uh, uh, honestly, with honor, convey that back to the tribe because they base their decisions on what the scouts bring back. Scouts live behind enemy lines. Scouts live way deep uh, in in uh, in in the heart of the darkness. And the other is to bring back the accurate reports uh, and to do the best they can to get the best information into uh, the hearts and minds of all the members of the tribe as possible. And our tribe is all 7 billion people on the planet. That's the de facto situation here. You, you meet and, 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 and beat those standards easily, and that's why I'm extremely happy to have you on the show tonight. Um, uh, what kind of responses have you been getting? I, I, I know that now, especially since, uh, since, since I picked this up belatedly, a lot more people are looking at these documents. My Facebook page went crazy. People were pulling you know, scores of excerpts out. My, my God, look at this one. My God, look at that one. And it was sinking in. What kind of responses are you getting right now? Are you getting any interest? Are people asking to talk to you? Yes, and it's been a slow curve. And, and I don't deny, since you've looked into this, it's, it's picking up. People are showing, obviously, if you're looking into it, they're going to take it seriously. They don't really know me that well yet. But as time goes on, I, I've heard your hundredth monkey thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my hope, Mike, is that eventually enough of us monkeys figure out the truth about Fukushima and nuclear power. And that, that's like our priority right now to shut that down. So I've gotten positive responses other than the occasional go kill yourself type email in my box or what have you. But most of the general public is, and they understand it once they dig into it. And it's, it's such an eye-opener because if you have preconceived notions about how fascism works, how the corporate controls the government and influences the government, you'll lose all of those when you read these documents or read what I've condensed and put together to save you the time. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that was the point that I was getting to, is that what I have found is that when you read and condense, you do so ethically. Uh, I, I, I have uh, looked at many of your videos and and your writings, and I haven't read the book, but, you know, I've, I've been, believe me, I'm in, I've, I've been in it, and, and I'm nodding my head as I listen to you ask the common sense questions. Um, what are the big questions right now? We're down to about seven minutes. Um, just, just take a couple of minutes. What, what are the big questions? What do you want to know? After reading all this stuff and living with it more than the rest of us, what are the biggest questions burning in your mind? Well, okay, and I have a question for you, and that would be that, 
from your experience from 9-11 and, and your involvement there and, and your writing and, and your work in that department, mm -hmm. and considering what happened on 9-11, would you give us any advice as the public and people trying to bring this to light? What, what avenue should we take now? I mean, I've written the book. Mm -hmm. I've got the documentation out there. People's taken some interest in it. And, and right now, like you said, I, I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure what my next step will be other than to button the book up and get it in PDF form for everybody. A, so what do you think? That's a great question. That's a – damn, you're pretty good. I like you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, this could be the beginning yeah. of a beautiful friendship, Louie. Yeah, Louie, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, um, my, my long experience and, and the situation at, at present is absolutely clear that there is no, nothing to be gained by per, per pursuing any governmental conventional channel to get somebody to open up to start talking to us and addressing uh, what's in these documents. It's my complete opinion. <clears throat> that these documents must be used because of the probative value which they carry as self-authenticating documents. I can't say that enough. As the benchmark for what we consider the condition and the state of the Fukushima reactors to be. In other words, if you were to ask me what, where I would bet my life on what the most accurate description is, I would say these documents give it. Of course, they aren't recent. We don't have recent transcripts, but we know that nothing has been contained, and we know that, that, that we're being lied to. So the, the only avenue available to us now <clears throat> is to make as many people aware of this as possible and to hold the door open for anyone who wants to demonstrate and live their humanity, that we open that door and hold the space for them to come in lovingly so that we can receive them and participate with us on this side of the line because everything is at stake right now. Uh, so exposure is, is, uh, is, is the answer. Getting people to read these documents is the answer and, and, uh, and getting questions directed to people like Arnie, to people like Helen, to, 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 to all the way, I, I don't mean to single them out. Anybody who might know anything needs to come forward. This is our, this is our obligation as human beings to each other. Um, we've got, okay, so that was a great question. What was the question I asked you? Were you, were you evading the question? I think I I'm trying to figure out where I'm, you know, what am I going to do from here with this thing? And you no, pretty much answered my what are your biggest questions? What, like, if you could find out one answer to a condition of anything at Fukushima right now, what would you want to know? If I could, I would fly inside of Unit 4, and I would look around if I could withstand the RAD level in there, and I'd, I'd get some re real footage, and I'd hold a newspaper up with a date on it and a current event to prove it was legitimate and scan around. I mean, they, once they put the covers over those things, they can tell the general public what they want, and... As you can see, the masses of people paying attention to mainstream, they're completely fooled by it. So i got to give them credit. They're, they're organized. They're, they're experienced. They're dedicated. They work hard, man. The adversary is, they, they know what they're doing. I, I give them that much. I don't like what they're doing, but I have respect for them, no doubt about it. Well, it's, it, it's wise to respect your, energy, your, your enemy, but to me it's abundantly clear I, none of the videos being released out of unit 4 to me are credible in any way for the exact reasons that you just described they haven't walked the camera over inside a structure peered over into a spent fuel pool underneath we're getting all these clips edited still shots and little clips of footage none of which establish the authenticity of what tepco claims to be doing now and what so much of the, the the corporate media in the world and the, and the national governments of the world, uh, you know, are, are all trying to shove down our throats. We know they're they're shoving us poison. Um, and that's what's so frustrating about this. And 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 this is this is the crying need. It is not to evaluate you to to evaluate me. Is we need to know what the hell's going on there. And what you, what you have given us is absolute, incontestable, legal evidence of enormous probative value 
that says clearly, and these guys, you know, the New York Times has, you know, come out with spin stories. Oh, they were confused. They didn't know what they were saying. And I say, bullshit. I read the transcripts. These people are speaking unequivocally with certainty about the conditions there. There was no confusion expressed. Gee, we don't know in these documents. Uh, and I was especially, we got one minute left, and I was especially concerned about uh, the, 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 uh, the, it came close to a presidential order to, uh, to evacuate all Americans uh, from Tokyo. Uh, and, and, and that was acknowledged very early on. So, Tony, I, I, I don't know what else to say. I was going to take a few minutes to talk at the end, but, you know, I feel spent, and I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. I, it is my prayer that you continue to do what you're doing. You are articulate. You make great videos. Uh, your your critical thinking skills are are uh, terrific, and you are serving your fellow man. So I'm, we're at the end of the show tonight. So I I just want to thank you for joining us, and I'm probably thinking we're going to have to have you back. That would be excellent. Can I real quick just thank Shazam and Maureen for assistance with the FOIA documents? They they did excellent work and how wouldn't be here today with my work the way it was without their assistance so i do thank them very much and i thank you as well mr rupert very very much uh this this was a pleasure i know we did some good uh hatrick penry tony muga at hatrick penry dot wordpress dot com finding him on facebook as hattie hatrick penry uh he's around you will not have to look hard to find him and the work he has done your life and your children's lives uh, depends more on you understanding what's in there than reading anything else or understanding anything else right now. This is Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth. Uh, pretty drained after this show tonight, December 1st, uh, 2013. I will be back with you next week. Tony, thank you for being with us. Everybody carry on. Good night. <laughs>